you all are wondering what the semiconductor. They have had a monumental impact on technology and society, and are now prevalent everywhere in the form of integrated circuits and microchips. Calculators, computers, radios, cars, refrigerators, remotes, digital clocks, watches, and even toasters and toys contain semiconductor microchips, to name a few. They have replaced bulky thermionic devices like cathode tubes and allowed the miniaturization of technology both at home and in industry. Imagine having to play or work on huge computers of the past, huge computers that take up your whole room and run slower than Windows Vista. Yet, what is this semiconductor that makes modern tech possible? It is a substance with electrical resistivity less than insulators and more than conductors. Comparing this to conductors, like metals, conductors have delocalized electrons that are shared between their atoms and can move freely through the solid lattice, conducting electricity, making them excellent conductors. In insulators, even though there is sharing between electrons in insulators, like covalent compounds, the electrons are held tightly by their covalent bond and cannot move freely through the solid, making them poor conductors. Properties of semiconductors cannot be explained this way, and most semiconductors like silicon and germanium curiously have decreased resistivity and hence greater conductivity as temperature increases. These properties can be explained if we look at things from a molecular level. Every atom has small negative charges orbiting it, known as electrons. After the photoelectric effect experiment by Einstein, which conceptualized the wave-particle duality of light, a scientist named de Broglie proposed that these electrons similarly possess a wave-particle duality, with electrons demonstrating both wave and particle-like natures. He hypothesized that in order for a stable electron orbit to occur, the electron must have a standing wave pattern of vibration, with the circumference of its orbit a whole number of its wavelengths. What does this mean? Well, as seen from the diagram, electrons must have specific wave patterns in order to form a stable electron orbit. If not, the wave pattern would destructively interfere with itself and the orbit would decompose. But this does not happen in practice. The de Broglie theory of electrons hence shows that electrons must occupy specific energy states or energy levels. Any other orbits would result in the destructive standing wave interference and hence orbital decomposition. So, in individual atoms, electrons occupy energy levels that can be represented as such. When two atoms are close enough to each other, the positive nuclei of the atoms will interact with the electrons in energy states and by the Pauli exclusion principle, they create two closely spaced energy levels. When millions of atoms come together in a crystal lattice, like say in a semiconductor, then the energy levels of the electrons will be spaced out but combined together to form whole energy bands. These bands are made out of millions of electron energy states combined together. The highest field energy band is known as the valence band. And the band above it, which is the first unfilled band, is known as the conduction band. The region between the bands is known as the forbidden energy gap, and it occurs between all bands, not merely the conduction and valence bands, but the lower energy bands as well. As mentioned earlier, de Broglie's particle wave theory of electrons states that electrons can only occupy specific energy states. The forbidden energy gap arises from the inability of electrons to form stable orbits in this region. If electrons manage to obtain enough energy to jump the energy gap and enter the conduction band, then the solid will be able to conduct electricity. This band theory can be used to explain the differing properties of conductors, semiconductors and insulators. In conductors, the valence band is partially filled and there are unfilled energy levels in the valence band. This means valence bands and conduction bands overlap in conductors and there is no energy gap. Electrons can easily move from the valence band to the conduction band conductors and hence conduct electricity easily, providing metals with low resistance. In insulators, the valence band is completely filled and there is a huge energy gap between the conduction and valence bands. A large quantity of energy is required to excite an electron from the conduction band to the valence band. Imagine trying to jump from ground level to the 50 meter high floor of a building. It might be possible, but an excessively large amount of energy would be required to propel you or an electron up to that floor or band. Similarly, a large amount of energy would be required 
to excite an electron in an insulator from the valence band to the conduction band and hence a lot of energy is required for an insulator to conduct electricity giving it its very high resistance. In contrast, exciting an electron in a metal to the conduction band would be like walking up a tiny step. Very little energy is required to allow the electrons to conduct electricity. Semiconductors have a larger energy gap than conductors, which have a negligible or absent energy gap, but a smaller energy gap than insulators, causing them to have a resistance intermediate of conductors and insulators. Continuing the analogy, conducting would be like attempting to jump up to a 1 meter high floor of a building. Electrons still require energy to jump the energy gap and reach the conduction band, but less than insulators. Heat or light can be used to provide this energy to allow the electrons to reach the conduction band. As more heat is provided and the temperature of the semiconductor increases, more electrons will be excited from the valence band and move to the conduction band, creating holes in the valence band. Both holes in the valence band and electrons in the conduction band are charge carriers and improve the conductivity of the semiconductor. This increased number of charge carriers at higher temperatures hence reduces the resistance of semiconductors as temperature increases. In the earlier models, you may have seen some positive holes. What is a hole? An electron hole or hole is an atom with one missing electron and can be created when a quanta of energy hits an electron in the valence band and excites it to the conduction band, leaving a hole. Electrons from nearby valence band atoms can move to the hole and fill it, in the process creating another hole in the solid. As electrons move to fill the new holes created, such as under the influence of an electric field, they allow the hole to move through the solid. Holes hence act as positive charge carriers and move in the opposite direction to electrons moving in the conduction band. Under normal conditions, conductors like metals have much more free electrons that can drift from atom to atom than semiconductors and insulators. However, as mentioned earlier, if temperature increases or if certain lighting conditions are met, semiconductors can induce electrons to the conduction band and increase the number of free, mobile electrons in the solid, reducing the semiconductor's resistance. This can be demonstrated in an experiment. The experiment will use a breadboard used for electronic circuitry experiments, a meter ruler which can be used to measure the distance between the light source and the photoconductor, the aforementioned photoconductor whose resistance decreases with increasing light intensity, wires, a multimeter used to measure electrical resistance, and a light source or torch. The independent variable for this experiment was the distance of the light source to the semiconductor, which is inverse squared proportional to light intensity, and the dependent variable was the resistance of the photoconductor. I will now demonstrate how the experiment was carried out. The apparatus is set up under dark conditions to minimize the impact of external lighting on the photoconductor. It will be set up as such. The torch will be at one end of the meter ruler, and the breadboard and the photoconductor will be at the other end of the meter ruler. Note that the position of the photoconductor coincides with the zero mark on the meter ruler. The photoconductor will, be, will it itself be attached to the multimeter, which can be used to measure its electrical resistance. The torch will then be set up at about 80 centimeters from the semiconductor, using the ruler to measure the distance. The resistance of the semiconductor, which read as 8.27 kilo ohms, was then recorded. The torch is now turned on, and the resistance of the photoconductor will be written down, 7.41 kilo ohms. The torch is then moved closer, 60 centimeters from the semiconductor, and the resistance is recorded down again. And this procedure is repeated with various distances from the semiconductor, like 40 cm and 20 cm, returning values of 7.3, 7.08 and 6.83 kilo ohms for 60, 40 and 20 cm respectively. Light intensity or luminosity can then be roughly calculated as 1 over the square of the distance and a graph of resistance against light intensity hitting the semiconductor can then be plotted. As can be seen from both the graph and the experiment, when the light is closer to the photoconductor, its resistance decreases. This is as the light is made out of photons of energy, which each have a quanta of energy. And when the light is shone on the photoconductor, these quanta of energy are provided in the form of photons and excite the valence band electrons to conduction band. 
More light equals more photons, resulting in lower resistance. This explains why its conductivity increases with light intensity and its resistance decreases with light intensity. This property of energizing electrons in photoconductors when they're hit with light photons is also what allows solar cells to work. The experiment was safe as the circuit was not connected to any voltage source. Like any good experiment, precautions must be taken to ensure that the experiment was valid and accurate. It was valid and accurate as the same light source was used throughout the experiment, external lighting conditions were kept constant and the orientation of the photoconductor towards the light was kept constant, so that distance was the only factor that affected light intensity. Reliability and accuracy, however, could have been improved by repeating the experiment several times to ensure that the experimental values obtained were not anomalous.